Welcome, Mr. Ward. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, it's it's quite all right. We'll give you an extra 15, 16 seconds. No worries. All right, it is 3.32. We will call to order this special session of the Del Norte Solid Waste Management Authority, City of Crescent City, County of Del Norte, and State of California. Uh, if you would please uh, call the roll. Here. 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 Commissioner Howard. Present. All right, very good. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To begin, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good. Thank you. Cool. We will open up public comment. Any member of the public may address the Solid Waste Management Authority on matters that are on or off the agenda after receiving recognition from myself. Please give your name and address for the record and please keep your comments to three minutes. Do we have any general public comment this afternoon? Yes, Ms. Cooper. And I, um, a lot of thought after the workshop, you know, it's an ongoing um, project that requires a lot of creativity to get a hold on um, really getting our waste system and recycling back in um, proper order and um, I made a, a compiled a, a list of um, interesting websites and ideas for to share with all of you I I sent it um, to you it, um, it was printed with the agenda Okay, so yeah, I haven't looked <laughs> through all the materials. But um, what struck me is that um, the, the big cans, they send the wrong message. And, um, and really, we want to incentivize um, our recycling. Um, I, there are um, age, um, groups that um, have incentive programs. Um, they're a li little bit pricey to set up with barcodes and stuff, but we can make it our own. Uh, and my best idea is that why just have Julindra and the transfer station? Why not make every place a place of recycling? Man the can is what I call it. And um, every potential business could have we could develop a very attractive can that they could put in their store where if I come with a grocery bag full of, tr of recyclables, someone's there, throw it in, the store gets a sticker credit, we get a sticker credit, you save up the sticker credits, you get awards, you get, um, why would anyone want to just, you know, dump their recycling in a can and when they could had it go everywhere and the stores would be recognized by the paper as 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 being the winning stores for attracting you know getting people to recycle and um there are incentive programs out there that are kind of like that where you get bank recycle bank notes um and barcodes if you you um throw out a certain amount of recycled stuff but I really don't think bigger, tr bigger trash cans is the answer because um, there's nobody watching still. Hmm. And it's bad behavior. And everyone likes entering a raffle, everyone forget throwing out their recycling. Everybody's going to want to uh, get credit for maybe purchases at the store. I mean, the stores are going to love it. Every place, and it, it would integrate. One principle of recycling is to mainstream it, make it the norm, make it visible in a community. Um, this um, part of everyday activity. So, okay. Thank, thank that's you. That's my best idea. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. All right. Any other public comment of a general nature this afternoon? 
Seeing none, we'll close public comment. We'll bring it back to the uh, authority and uh, move into open session. We have some items on our consent uh, agenda. The uh, minutes from April 11th, uh, May 11th, uh, a payment of $10,419 to Redwoods Levitt Insurance, uh, claim to Bush Systems International in the amount of $8,977.47. Sponsorship of the Delnor County Fair, the uh, approval of authority, authority allocated bin pulls uh, for 4th of July and 5th of July beach cleanup and a budget transfer in the amount of $13,348. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Uh, would you please pull the vote? Sorry. Cohen? Yes. Reno? Yes. Howard? Yes. And then score. Yes. Thank you. Very good. We'll move on then to our director's and treasurer's <laughs> report. Uh, Mr. Ward. Yes. Thank you, Chair and Score. Uh, once again, the solid waste facilities at uh, Gasky, Klamath, and the Delmar County Transfer Stations were open during our posted hours, and staff provide these services without any financial support from the City of Crescent City or the County of Del Norte and without receiving a penny of taxes. And furthermore, the rates charged to the authority managed facilities continue to be lower than any comparable facilities in Humboldt or Curry counties. Uh, you just approved the agenda item, so I'll skip over those items. Uh, regarding landfill post closure, we, the land, the erosion damage that occurred over the winter storm still has not been repaired. There's a, several reasons for that. One is we wanted to make sure that those were as reimbursable as possible under the uh, Office of Emergency Services as several of the winter storms were declared uh, state and federal uh, emergencies. And so we were trying to get uh, plans from the engineering department. Uh, Rick Lockstead has been of tremendous help there, but we need plans in order to get a cost estimate, and we were in the process of trying to secure that cost estimate. I also met with uh, representatives of the airport authority and parks uh, just this morning looking at the uh, property that might be considered as part of the land swap for some of the um, areas immediately adjacent to the airport where trees need to be uh, lower in height uh, under FAA regulations. So the airport is considering a swap with the, from the property owned by the airport, uh, by parks immediately adjacent to the airport where they need to reduce the tr tree height and the southern end of the landfill property where we've done mitigation wetlands. And so the parks representatives were looking at those parcels for habitat values and other additional considerations. So um, that meeting seemed to go pretty well. There was lots of discussions about the potential mitigations of trying to uh, uh, impede off-road vehicle traffic that's going through there and accessing the big dune south of the landfill property and discussion about the potential for removal of some of the exotic invasive species that are there such as the uh, beach grass. But generally the meeting went pretty well and uh, the authority at this point is not committed to any uh, financial costs associated with that change as far as I know but the situation will continue to evolve. The only monitoring uh, impact that we have is under the federal regulations, RICRA subtitle D, we're required to have gas monitoring locations every 200 feet around the property perimeter of the landfill. So there is one of those gas monitoring locations on the property that is to be swapped. So that gas monitoring location would need to move, but that's not a significant challenge. Other items uh, that uh, won't be discussed elsewhere on the agenda include uh, attachment B to the staff report is the city of Crescent City has a clean sweep. That's a yard debris collection event. So uh, addresses that are within city limits that are um, on south of 9th Street, their collection will be Tuesday, May 30th. That's the a collection done by city crews and those brush materials are delivered to, to the Del Norte County Transfer Station and Hambro has agreed to waive their fees. So it's a free service to city residents. City residents who are uh, living on 9th Street or North, their collection event will be on Wednesday, May 31st. Also, we have a mattress collection up event coming up at the Del Norte County Transfer Station, uh, June 10th from 9 a.m. till 2 p.m. 
Del Mar County households can bring up to four mattresses or box springs uh, for no charge. Uh, out of uh, people who live outside of Del Mar County or uh, in Oregon would be charged their usual fee or folks who bring in more than four mattresses will be charged. A question mm -hmm. when you're doing this event where are you advertising it at besides the paper and radio is there flyers that are out like over at health and there are flyers for our customers coming through the transfer station but that uh, you've no we haven't done much beyond that do you have suggestions I would think health and human services the clinic places that the lo yeah okay are other community places that a lot of people walk through and I don't know if you have a flyer well, we do have a flyer, and um, I don't mind going around sticking them up, but I just think um, I just think it needs to be more advertised, especially on the mattress end of it. I think that's something that people who are dumping, I'd rather them know that they can take it somewhere. Sure, excellent suggestion. No, we'll we'll do that. And uh, like I said, that event is uh, June tenth, so we do have some time. But thank you for that suggestion. Um, this uh, attachment D to this report summarizes uh, some of the changes under the change orders. Uh, in fact, I have a PowerPoint for this. Sorry. Okay, coming to life. Oops, let's see, can we... Okay, um, when I made the presentation for the budget to the Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Gitlin specifically wanted to see that this graph was updated. This graph indicates the total system revenues for essentially anybody who's paying anything for any kind of solid waste service, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So of the solid waste dollars spent in fiscal year 15-16, 61% uh, of those went to Recology, 25% of those went to Hambro, and 14% of those go to the Solid Waste Authority. Though the Solid Waste Authority is responsible for both of those subcontracts. With the rates proposed un and uh, described under the rate resolution uh, that you'll be considering today, our rates will remain the lowest in the region. Uh, while the rates will be going up from 144.04 per ton to 148.50, like I said, the rates will remain the lowest for similar facilities in Humboldt or Curry counties. Looking at the graph, we're still on the low end of both those bars. Looking at how the rates would change, uh, you can see that the uh, collection rates are going up a little bit more than 2%. So the standard 32 gallon service on the curb goes from uh, uh, could that be? Uh, it, I think I have the, yeah, that year is mislabeled. I apologize. It goes from 2561 to 2613. Um, so that first column there is uh, actually, this is mislabeled. That should be 1516, just like it is over there. But these are the old rates. These are the new rates. This is the dollar amount difference, and that's the percentage difference. Looking at the uh, uh, rates at the transfer station, like you can see, we go from 144.04 per ton to 148.50 per ton, and the rate increase is a little bit over 3%. Looking at the rate changes in Gaskin and Klamath, our minimum charge goes from 875 to $9. And similarly for uh, 
the transfer station, the minimum charge goes from $7.20 to $7.50. But still, this leaves us with the lowest rates in the region. So we'll be discussing those uh, as change orders and as the rate resolution. Uh, the main presentation today will come from Jesse Solorio later in the uh, meeting about the process for repairing the transfer station floor. So we'll be talking about that in just a few. Regarding personnel and staffing, I'm happy to introduce uh, Kira Seymour, who you may have met at the town hall meeting, but she is uh, filling in for Kathy Brewer, who's on vacation, so she's our recording secretary tonight. Um, we did hire both uh, Kira Seymour as our facilities and programs coordinator, and uh, our, our former um, uh, refuse site attendant, Haley Smith, has been advanced to the account clerk position. So both are performing well, though they're in their um, uh, probationary periods. Also in this uh, attached to the director's report is a letter from Cal Recycle indicating that uh, our programs for recycling and reuse and composting are all within compliance for the years uh, 2012 through 2015. So that's good news. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions before moving on to the financial reports. Any questions for Mr. Ward? Yes. <clears throat> Is it normally done in a five-year increment on those Cal Recycle? Oh, the Cal Recycle audit. Um, they were a little backlogged. It's, it's usually every two or three year, years they give sort of an update and a program review, and then every five years they do a very serious review. And I think they just kind of extended the period. We got three years out of this last two-year review because it took them a while to complete it. Yeah, it's 2017. Yeah. We're just getting 2012 through 15 reports. So right. Outstanding. I'm glad government works at such a quick rate around here. We're doing our part. Are you being facetious? Never. All right. You, You're welcome. All right. Let's go on to financials, please. Okay. Uh, I will call attention to the board uh, that attached to the director's report are the letters that were submitted as part of the town hall meeting, so uh, for your review, uh, including the one uh, Ms. Cooper referred to, as well as the uh, reports from Recology about the processing of the recyclables. Uh, at the end of March, our cash in the bank was $969,826 plus 198, 177, which is the last month's rent. Uh, so generally, uh, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, regarding claims approved by director, once again, of course, the largest payment goes to Hambros, and that's our annual payment. Uh, you see two fairly large payments to Bush Systems. So that was for the airport containers under, paid for under the grant. Um, and you can see that there's also a $2,000 expense uh, purchasing drain containers as part of the oil grant program. Um, other financial reports, generally I'll, I'll cut to the bottom line, which is our uh, revenue comparison. So on item 2.5, uh, under authority service fees, you'll see that uh, at this point in time, with two months left in the fiscal year, we're nearly 60,000 ahead of our projected budget. So our revenue is coming in nicely. And uh, regarding uh, franchise revenue, our, we're a little bit behind budget. We're $2,800 behind budget. So as a net, we're um, uh, about uh, 55000 ahead of budget. So we're doing fairly well in terms of cash, and we're not overspending any of our budget lines. So our budget looks pretty good. Very good. Any questions for Mr. Ward on our financials? All right, let's go ahead and move on then. Okay. So 3.1 is, um, I, I didn't want to overly complicate this for you, but I, I did want to indicate that essentially we need to go probably back to the board supervisors and revisit our pledge of revenue agreement. The pledge of revenue agreement is essentially promising that if anything goes wrong with the Crescent City landfill, is the agency responsible for both the landfill and the transfer station, we promise that we'll pay for those expenses using the revenues from the transfer station. However, while this has been adopted and approved, we're not able to locate the document that has the wet ink signatures on it, which is what CalRecycle requires. And so they're insisting that they get that document. So I may have to go back to the Board of Supervisors and get a fresh signed copy. But before I introduce that topic to the Board of Supervisors, I thought I would all let you all know that 
this is what we need to do. The reason why we need to do this is that we uh, annually, under standing direction from the board, we apply for a reduction in our multiplier. That means the multiplier is used this way. In order to calculate the amount of liability associated with the Crescent City landfill, we are required to determine what our annual maintenance costs are, and then we multiply that times 30. So you have a 30-year post-closure maintenance period. The landfill closed in 2006. You take your annual maintenance fee, you multiply that times 30. That's your liability. Well, as time goes on, of course, years pass. So we closed it in 2006. We're now at 2018. We think it's appropriate that we have a lower multiplier than 30 because we're that much into our 30-year post-closure maintenance period. However, we have to apply for this every year, and so we have to apply to CalRecycle. Can we reduce our multiplier? And their response this time was, after you get us all of the paperwork for the pledge of revenue that we need, then you will consider reducing your multiplier. So that's what's put us into this position. But that's important because even though these are honestly paper numbers, because no matter what the number is we have to pay out, we're still going to pay it from the transfer station. Uh, regardless, it does make an impact because we may have to finance the transfer station floor repair, for example, and our outstanding liabilities can impact the, the finance charges that we pay when we finance that expense. This making sense? So the bottom line is that uh, there's no additional action required, but I wanted to give you all a heads up that I'll probably have to go to the Board of Supervisors and possibly the City Council to um, make sure that all of these agreements are up to date so that we have the paperwork I can send off to CalRecycle. Okay. That's a good deal. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, item 4.1 is change order 11 with uh, Recology Del Norte. This is a standard part of our agreement. Uh, each year there's a consumer and price index adjustment that's given to both the collection rates and the rates charged at the Del Norte County Transfer Station. So this is in our agreement and we do this every year and it's, it's just a math exercise largely. Uh, I have uh, forwarded the draft change order both to our legal counsel as well as our contractors so they've had an opportunity to, to review it and staff would recommend approval of change order 11. Motion to approve change order number 11. I have a motion to have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve change order number 11. Do we have any public comment? All right, seeing no public comment, we'll bring it back to the authority then. And uh, if you would please pull the vote. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Greenow? Yes. Commissioner Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Inscore? Yes. Chair Inscore? Sorry. That's, that's fine. Yes. All right, very good. Yeah. What do we got left? Transfer station. So we're, we're ready to. It's showtime. Can, can we go ahead and, and knock out 5.2? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's coming up and getting set up, and I'll let Christine to pull up the, the video. Um, the, uh, or I'll, I'll pull up that link. Uh, but essentially, change order 25 is a rate adjustment based on the changes to consumer price index for the collection rate for the service fees charged by Hambro WSG at the Del Mar County Transfer Station, and the staff recommend approval. Motion to approve. I have a motion to have a second. Second. All right, I have a motion to second. Any public comment on change order 25? All right, seeing none, bring it back. Would you please pull the vote? Commissioner Kellen? Yes. Commissioner Greenow? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Chair Inscore? Yes, very good. All right. We're going to watch a music video? Oh, oh. 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 Wow, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And my name is Jesse Solorio with Lawrence and Associates, and we specialize in solid waste facilities. So we work on landfills, material recycling facilities, and transfer stations. Now, in uh, 2014, I was working on the Cummings Road landfill closure down in Eureka. And they asked me to come look at the Hawthorne Street transfer station. And they were having some uh, raveling and some damage to the floor, very similar to what you guys are having. 
and uh, they, they let it sit for a while until they started pulling up rebar, same as you guys. And so now you're at a point where you need to do something about it. And so uh, at that point, I researched a bunch about what normal wear is and what are some of these potential repairs that we can use. And I, I can tell you about the small handful of products that are out there, but we ended up settling on what's called Yuko Floor uh, 404 by a company called Euclid Chemical. And the reason why I uh, use that is because City of Reading used it in their high volume transfer station. And I've seen several different installations of it and its performance. And so uh, I had a fairly good uh, comfort level on, on using this product. So uh, we went out to bid uh, specifying Yuko uh, floor, but also an alternate additive or a, uh, uh, an acceptable alternative from the, the board. And uh, they only got one bid. Uh, later on, I did another floor of this for Hanford at the Kings County Transfer Station, and they got two bids. So that it's not that these are the only people that can do it. Um, and uh, it worked out really well. Uh, I actually just went back there yesterday to take a look at it to see how the uh, the performance has been, and it's it's holding up very well. So, uh, as as I said, since the this Hawthorne Street, we're going to show you uh, the installation here. Uh, I've also done one for Kings County, and th theirs is also working pretty well. Uh, came and looked at your floor this morning, and the uh, damage I'm seeing there isn't anything out of the ordinary uh, nowadays uh, with you know, the attack, chemical attack that we're getting from leachate and since the Clean Water Act that's now, you know, being brought to your floors instead of uh, dripping out on the streets like they used to in days gone by. Uh, you know, that coupled with, you know, just the normal wear and tear is causing these issues. Now, some transfer stations, when you design them, you design these type of high strength floors into them, but they're actually, you know, they're very expensive. So uh, you guys have about 1,200 square feet that need to be addressed. And the going price, uh, especially up here because there's a, a bit of extra cost for mobilization, is about $70 a square foot. So you're looking at the around $84,000 uh, range to repair your floor right now. And so uh, $70 a square foot for any type of flooring seems pretty outrageous. Uh, the reason why you have that high cost is because, uh, one, it's tremendously strong material. It's 20,000 PSI concrete which is far more than any normal concrete that you'd buy you know, from a local supplier. And uh, they can put it in and have you operating in three days, which is not normal. If, if we wanted to go a more traditional route and just jackhammer out and repair the floor as it stands right now, you're looking at a month before you can get back on your floor. And that's just, and most times, that's too cost prohibitive because of the concessions you have to make sending your waste elsewhere. Uh, Certainly. Mm -hmm. It's called Yuko Floor. Yeah, Euclid Chemical uh, manufactures it. Yeah, there's a couple other uh, companies, Anvil Top, and uh, there's some that are epoxy based, but the epoxy based ones are even more expensive. And I, I actually haven't seen one installed yet. Yes. Yes. And uh, when I did the Hawthorne Street video, I took some video and I put together a little montage that shows you how it how it comes together uh, so there'll be an epoxy uh, or they clean it very very well they put epoxy down and sand uh, coat over the epoxy and then this just pours right on top of it but you get to set that I would recommend about an inch and a half for you guys and that's not going to be a uniform thickness it'll be uh, thicker where the um, excavators picking from right now because we have more wear. You have about two and a half inches of extra wear right there where the where the bucket's picking it up. Is it also or is it no, it's non permeable service, yeah. I've handed samples to the board so you can review the uh, the clearest example of the overcoat that we're talking about is that darker material and you can actually see the metal flex that are used in there because it is a metal reinforced concrete but but not just with rebar but also including metal actually used in the concrete product so is this sitting like a sample of what the the yuko floor on top of concrete or is this just a is this all this the flooring you know i'm not certain i think that might have some of the lower strength yuko floor materials stuck to it i don't i don't think that's standard concrete underneath it because okay. the aggregate looks too small yeah the floor. How old is the floor? Uh, operations started in uh, 2005, 
March 2005. Okay, and we're having to repair it. Is mm -hmm. that normal, wear and tear on floors? I mean, you seem to work on floors all the time. I mean... It, it can be, certainly, yeah. It, and you'll see, if you go out on your facility, we're not talking about your whole floor. We're talking about where all the action's happening. So why did we put this down in the first place? It's, it's a rare thing. Uh, I, I design transfer stations also. Uh -huh. I'm actually designing one for Glenn County right now. And for, especially for low volume transfer stations, it's just something you wouldn't put across your whole floor because it's, it's pretty expensive. It's better to wait, see where your wear is and come in and put it then. So this won't go across the whole floor, it's only no. going on our wear? No, I, like I said, it's about 1,200 square feet, so it's about a 35 by 35 area. What's the life of this product? It really depends on, uh, on the, uh, the type of waste that you're putting on it. And uh, actually more things, uh, if you have rubber push bars on your, uh, on your dozer and how careful people are as they're picking it up. I mean, there's a very large uh, uh, number of variables. But uh, as I said, the one I put at, uh, or I didn't put myself, but I you know, monitored it at uh, Hawthorne you can barely see anywhere on it, and that was you know, two and a half years ago now that it's been in service. Uh, City of Reddings, they've had one there that was about 10 years, and you know, it's still performing well. So if I had to guess, I'd say you, know, you, you can probably strongly count on another 12 years, if not longer. 12 years for $84,000 sounds like a deal to me. Sounds like a very good deal. <laughs> okay, well. You got a video for us to look at here? Yeah, so this, this is one of those things where you see that number and you think, holy moly, why is it so expensive? Christina? You'll, you'll see as they're doing it. Um, they come out of Los Angeles, this crew, and they'll mobilize about two dozen laborers. Which is this one? Oh, so this is the one from... Uh, this wasn't the video that I did. This is the video from uh, Amer uh, America. It was yeah. what popped up when I did the search. Sorry about that. That's fine. It covers a lot of the same territory. Yeah, so, so this is them doing the initial preparation. We had a public tip. We also did some repairs as well as the, the main tipping floor. So before they can place down the epoxy, which is the, um, the interface in between the, the, the high strength um, metallic coating, they have to clean it really well. So they'll come out with shot blasters and these uh, uh, little scrabblers, and they'll just go back and forth cleaning it over and over. Uh, at the transitions between the, the existing floor and where they're gonna start heading up and put the overlay, They'll come through and they'll they'll saw cut a line and then they'll use jackhammers to to break it out. You can see that's what they're they're doing now is they're cutting in that keyway. And again, they're they're getting all the prep done and the epoxy floor in one day, and then they're placing the floor the second day, and then uh, final prep the third day, and then they're you're ready to use your floor again. The epoxy is being put down and the sands are getting placed on top. They mix it on site inside these concrete trucks because from the time you add water to it uh, to the time when it's too plastic to work is about an hour. Wow. Yeah. And so you'll see that they, they really hustle when they're putting this stuff in. This, this is sped up, but still they... Yeah, <laughs> and that that's a set retardant that they're huh? shooting right, on they it. Get stuck after all. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, uh, one of the nice things they do when you do these overlays is you pop one of these guys, you go through and you saw cut on a grid throughout your floor and you drop these little aluminum wear indicators in and then you pox them in place and then as your floor begins to wear different amounts of this will become uh, evident through your floor so you can tell how much wear you've had whereas uh, normally you can't tell.
and that's just some fancy thing where they're using lasers to to topo your floors. That's not not necessary, but <laughs> makes for a good graphic. So, so that's it. That's what it's like to install one of those floors. And that's why it's cost so much money because you've got lots of people involved to make it happen. So we're not actually replacing the entire floor. No, nope. we're gonna essentially you'll you'll take the floor as it sits right now. You'll just clean it really well and then add a couple inches on top of it. Okay. Right. Yeah. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Ward, anything else you, you want to say right now? I, I just mentioned that this is going to be, a, a as a construction project, it will be a bid project, which means that once we uh, approve the plans and specifications for release, that the the decision will be simply, is the contractor qualified under the bids and specs and who has the best price? Um, that's who will get the job. Uh, but I do think that uh, we, haven't, we haven't done a construction bid project in some time. So our next steps on this, we're actually going to be get a cost estimate and um, start working with the county auditor to make sure that we're doing the right thing in terms of the financing. So that will be the, our next discussion about this issue. I, I want to make sure we have all the right answers to those questions before I, I respond. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, now that we're talking about what I would consider to be a workable number, it makes a lot more sense to be looking at it from this standpoint of, of, of a budgetary issue as opposed to I mean, when we're talking about a million dollars or something like that to replace the floor, I mean, we're talking a whole different world right now. Right. Eighty-four thousand dollars. I mean, we're sixty thousand dollars ahead of the game for this year only. I mean, it seems to me like we, we if, if the trend continues going out the rest of this year, we ought to be able to work some way of, of setting, doing a set aside with the with the, the savings from this fiscal year, place that into next year's uh, budget, and, and, and we, we should be able to pay for this thing in, in two years and get it done. But I know you have to go through the auditor and get that worked out, but I'd really like to see us do it from that standpoint and, and not, I just see no reason for, for a debt service for something that's $84,000. But that's All right. Fine. Do we have any public comment regarding the presentation uh, on the transfer floor? Okay, then we will move Can on. Can I ask Ted a question? What's that? Can I ask Ted a question? Yeah. Okay. Can I join the party? Sure. Well, okay. I... um, <laughs> is this the only company that does this? I mean, have you checked with other companies, there, or where are we at on that? Well, because we'll be going through a bid process, uh, we're working with Lawrence and Associates, and they're going to be both developing the uh, the bid documents working the bid process and uh, doing construction quality assurance while the construction is going on. So uh, the selection of the contract will base, be based on qualified contractors. My understanding is there are only one or two contractors that are qualified to, to do, do this, this kind of work. Okay. Well, they were just from way down south. And I was just... uh, because there are so few contractors, though, they're usually used to traveling. All right. Very good. Um, good. Good news, I think. Uh, very good news. Okay, well, let's move on then. G uh, General Solid Waste Management wa uh, Waste Authority matters. We uh, we have a resolution that we need to uh, consider. Uh, now that uh, change orders 11 and 25 have been approved, uh, the final step in implementing those rate changes uh, in support of the budget uh, are uh, the adoption of resolution 2017-01. In addition to in <coughs> enacting the rate changes in those change orders, it also clarifies the rates to be charged in the Gasky and Klamath transfer stations. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve resolution 2017-01. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment on this resolution? All right, seeing no public comment, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the authority. Would you please pull the vote? Commissioner Cowan? Yes. Commissioner Greenow? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Chair in score? Yes. All right, very good. We have one item left on our um, agenda, and that is a legislative, couple of legislative questions or advocacy positions. Right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, 
we were really hoping that at this point in time there would be some piece of legislation that would address the challenges that are facing California's bottle bill and therefore adjusting the payments to processors. Unfortunately, at this point in time, the only action that seems to be coming out of the legislature on that is the, uh, cal is the governor's budget. Uh, there are two other relevant bills, and there's some movement afoot to try to work on uh, uh, another process, but at this point, there are only two bills that we're looking very closely at. The first one is AB 1288, and honestly, I don't think it's going anywhere because it's already, um, no, I'm sorry, uh, 1288 is a bill that essentially empowers the Air Resources Board to legislate additional cow recycle fees. This is relevant to us in that most jurisdictions in California pay $1.40 per ton for materials that are disposed of in California landfills. Our materials are not disposed in California landfills, and therefore we have not been paying this fee. So, um, but at the same time, we do receive monies from Cal Recycle, so it, it's, it's, not un, it's not surprising that they're looking at the possibility of doing this. The language that indicated that they were going to be raising fees for rural communities like ours has since been stricken from the bill. So it's not entirely clear that uh, the Air Resources Board would raise our fees, but this bill would enable them to do so. So at this point, we're just recommending a watch position because it looks like it's not going to be harmful, but it's, it's hard to say at this point. Um, regarding SB 168, this is the bill that I really don't think is going anywhere it, because it's been put on the suspense file and it's a very long bill. It's over 160 pages and um, it's not very well structured or thought out and it's not seeing a lot of support. So I don't think it's really going anywhere. But it is bad enough that I would recommend an opposed position should it come out of that committee because uh, this bill would essentially make uh, the deposit system we have in California into a product stewardship model based on the mattress recycling model. Uh, thank you for that laughter. <laughs> because that's, that's the appropriate response. So well structured. <laughs> Not. <laughs> right. So um, consequently, it, it's a, and, and the ironic thing is while all of the money would be going to Coke and Pepsi, uh, the Department of Re Division of Recycling would still have all of the same responsibilities. They just wouldn't have any money to do it. So it's just not a well-structured bill. But the other thing that we're trying to watch is uh, essentially being uh, fostered by Californians Against Waste. And uh, towards that end, uh, I included uh, in your packet a three-year fix for California bottle bill uh, from Californians Against Waste. Generally, this is an approach that I agree with, that I think is worth supporting, but there isn't a specific piece of legislation that is pursuing this model at this point. So um, staff recommendation at this point is to adopt the two positions on those two bills, the, the watch position and the opposed position on SB 168, and, um, and to continue to watch the process that's being supported by Californians Against Waste, and as soon as there's a bill to support, to bring it back. So taking an opposing position to that bill, what are, what are we going to do besides just oppose it? Oh, uh, we, uh, when we actually adopt a position to the extent that uh, it appears that we, that opinion might have influence, then I'll write letters saying the board has adopted an opposed position on this bill and, and send that to the committees that are considering it. Would we see that before you send it or? Probably not. Usually the, the committee happens, the committee's meetings happen pretty quickly. And since we're on a monthly cycle, oftentimes I'm not able to get a draft letter into the agenda and still have it delivered in a timely fashion to the legislature. I'd still like to see that. Okay. Well, um, would Before it be acceptable it if you adopted the, just thinking it through here, if you adopted an opposed position, would it be acceptable that I could send a letter off in a timely fashion and then include it in the director's report so you still got a chance to see it? Would that be okay? Or you want me to wait until the next meeting and get your approval? I think that, it, it, that, that given the unlikelihood that this bill is going to be up for a vote between now and June, I think that uh, we, it would be best probably to go ahead and craft the letter um, an opposition letter, if, if in fact the, the authority is in consensus to do so, 
and bring it back to our June meeting just for stamp of approval from Fine. us. I, I, I would also like to not only uh, address the letter um, to the uh, appropriate, well, to the, it, I'd like the letter addressed in multiple formats to the author of the bill uh, as well as to uh, our own Senator um, Mike McGuire. Uh, so he realizes that this is something we're, we are concerned about as well. Okay. And then the appropriate committee, wherever it happens to be sitting right now. I, I didn't look up to see where it is sitting. Uh, but yeah, I think that we have time. Okay. If, if, if in fact there is a concern when you go to do that and, and look and discover that, that uh, A, we need to get this in sooner, then I, I think it would be appropriate for you to, to email us all of that letter so that we all see it and you can take input from, from all of us individually if there's any material concerns that are expressed by the authority. Chair, are you looking for a motion or just consensus? At I think this that point? I think that if we have consensus to, consensus we'll be yeah. fine. If we have consensus to direct yes. uh, our executive director to work on this. All right, very okay. good. I, I do have one other. I, I was somewhat intrigued by the letter you included from Mr. Uh, Richard Valley mm -hmm. uh, for Alameda, Alameda County Supervisor District Two, and the the questions that he brought up regarding the state holding on to this money that had been being funneled back to buyback centers and i would be very interested in in maybe you reaching out to him and and getting some other information because this seems like a very good advocacy point to to make back with our state representatives and say give us back the money you're you're create your you know we have a problem here that we are struggling to solve and you're adding to the problem, not adding to the solutions. So I think we should, I think we should approach this, and maybe you already have, uh, but. I, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion. And I'll, I'll have you know that I, I, mean, I haven't given up on advocacy on this issue. And so part of the reasons that I was working with Richard Valle, who is an Alameda County supervisor and also runs a TRICED, which is a community-based recycling uh, organization down in the East Bay. Uh, but I am organizing a workshop for the Statewide Trade Association, California Resource Recovery Association, and he'll, he will be one of the panelists where we'll be discussing potential ways to address the crisis facing the bottle bill. Very good. All right. You have anything else for us, Mr. Ward? No, that's it, sir. Anybody have anything for the good of the authority? Nothing. All right, you guys are awesome. Then we will stand adjourned until our next regular scheduled meeting, which is June 20th. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, thanks. Signatures.